This is the Sphere microcomputer from 1975. Last time, we looked at the two main boards that make up the core of the computer, and saw what it can do when you power it up. Not all that much, it turns out. Or rather, it certainly did a lot for its time, but had no means of loading or saving programs or other information. Today, that's all going to change as we add mass storage to our sphere in the form of tape cassettes. Back in the 1970s, disk storage was prohibitively expensive for home users or hobbyists, so it was very common to store data on regular audio tapes. Here are some games for the sphere that we'll take a look at. This is the second video in a series about the obscure but important Sphere microcomputer from Salt Lake City in 1975. I'm an engineer and technology historian writing a book about the Sphere company, computer, and community. If you'd like to learn more, please visit sphere.computer. Recall that we have a CPU and CRT board. How is this computer going to read data from audio cassette tapes? Enter the SIM1, the serial interface module. This component was finalized in early 1976, and it's a sort of Swiss army knife for input and output. The board supports two simultaneous serial interfaces, and in addition to supporting cassette tapes, you could also configure it to talk to teletypes, paper tape punches, all sorts of terminals, and even act as a modem for telephone connections. Here are the two serial communication chips, Motorola 6850 ACIAs. There's sort of an upper section and lower section on the board that make up the two interfaces. This empty area on the right would be filled if you were using the board as a modem. The SIM has its own ROM chip, containing a small amount of firmware to read and write the cassette data. Just like our CPU and CRT boards, the SIM board is part of Sphere's modular system philosophy. It connects in using the same four ribbon cable setup. So let's get the SIM connected into our Sphere. You can see how this is starting to get a little unwieldy, right? It definitely is, and for the sake of being able to contain this setup to a table, we're going to get a little more organized. This is a card cage to hold the sphere boards vertically. I'll spare you watching the connection process yet again, but we can take the CPU, CRT, and SIM boards, slide them into the stand, and connect the cabling in the same way. Ultimately, of course, a full chassis and case would contain such a card cage internally, with up to seven boards exactly like this. So now our computer should be able to read and write from cassettes. And here's a fine looking portable cassette recorder. It has a microphone and earphone jacks like any good tape deck, and we can use those for directly connecting input and output audio. But how do we get those signals to the computer? If you guess the answer has to do with more 14-pin dip plugs, bingo! These two sockets provide all the many input and output signals for all the different serial interfaces, including the cassette audio in and out that we care about. But there's no standardized adapter for this, and Sphere didn't provide one you were expected to figure out how to make those connections yourself. Here's the wiring harness that I made. It connects the input and output of the tape recorder into the correct pins on the board socket. Good stuff. Connect to the microphone input and the earphone output, and we are good to go. Let's power the sphere back up to get to our blinking cursor. The command we'll use is a new one for loading from cassette. It's L for load, and in this case, we're going to follow it with the letters S, N, slash, and the number 400. This bit of required incantation is the file name and loading address for the program on tape. We're going to load the game Snake and by convention, the loading information is always marked on the tape itself. So we enter this command, and now the computer is waiting for the audio data. We push play on the tape deck and keep an eye on the screen. Pretty soon, bits from the tape in the form of an audio signal start streaming into the SIM board, and the resulting bytes are displayed in the top right corner of the screen, which is a useful indicator that it's reading something valid. That file, or block name, shown here, tells us what the firmware is currently reading. In this case, it's the one we are looking for. So in a short amount of time, not terribly long, since this program is less than a kilobyte in size, it will complete the load. When it's done, we can see the loaded start and end addresses reiterated here for us, and the blinking cursor is back. 
To run the program, we enter the debugger mode, which you may remember from the last video, and open location 400, where the program has loaded. With Control g we can run it. This is a new game. It's something I wrote myself. Of course, Snake is an early computer classic, but there was never a version for Sphere. What I like about this is that it demonstrates very clearly the power of memory mapped video. The game can produce updating animation without scrolling the screen. Although this capability became ubiquitous just a couple years later, it was remarkable for a microcomputer in 1975. You may also notice, besides the normal CRT capture flicker, that there are brief white horizontal streaks that flicker around the screen as it updates. This was endemic to Sphere video because of the way the circuit was designed. Users came up with all sorts of hardware mods to improve it, but you couldn't get rid of it entirely. Okay, enough of modern retro creations. Let's look at some actual Sphere software from the 70s. Before we dive in, I want to show off a neat additional feature of the SIM interface. When I showed the wiring harness earlier, I didn't mention this third smaller plug. It's optional and has a special interesting purpose. Remember the cassette recorder's set of jacks? One is marked REM, short for remote, intended to allow an external switch to enable and disable the motor. The Sphere can automate that circuit as well, and we can connect the SIM board to the remote input. Next program up is a simple vintage game called Shooting Stars. You can see that its file name is SS and it also loads at address 400. Because we've connected the remote plug, when we insert the tape and push play, nothing happens. It's just paused where it is, ready. So we go back to the computer and we enter our load command for block name SS and address 400. But check this out. As soon as we enter it, the SIM board has turned the tape player on for us and begins reading. Once again, we can watch the program loading with incoming bytes appearing on the top right. Shooting stars is a puzzle game where you shoot at stars, which turns them into black holes or something. The game was published in Byte Magazine in May of 1976, but traces its origin to the People's Computer Company in 1974 under the name Teaser. This version was made for Sphere and could be ordered on tape from Programma International for the princely sum of $5. And when the load is done, the tape stops. Cool. The object is to fill the board with stars by flipping adjacent spaces, and I've never managed to win. It's also rather hard to lose, but I have at least achieved that. You too can get roasted by anonymous programmers from the 1970s. Before we look at the final program, you may be curious how all of this actually works. What's on the tapes? Well, let's have a listen to the Shooting Stars tape with the sound on. Fair warning, if you never like the sound of a dial-up modem, you're not going to love this either. Okay, what you're hearing is data encoded in the Kansas City standard, named for the location of a small symposium hosted by Byte magazine in late 1975. Byte invited technical leaders from important micro companies at that time, and Mike Wise, the founder and creator of Sphere, was there. So were representatives from MITS, Processor Technology, and others. Young Bill Gates was there too, as part of the MITS faction for his Altair work. This group agreed upon a slow but reliable standard that used brief alternating tones of two different frequencies to represent zero and one bit values. Kansas City format tapes had a fixed data rate of 300 bits per second. It wasn't nearly as fast as a floppy disk would eventually be, but it was affordable and much quicker than typing programs in. Our final demonstration is Conway's Game of Life. This is not so much a game as a mathematical simulation. Life was a real craze among early microcomputer users. It was invented in 1970 by British mathematician John Conway, and by the time computers could be built at home, people got excited about running the simulation on their screens instead of by hand. The idea is that each location on the screen can represent a cell that is living, dying, or being born with certain rules about how survival works. The Sphere was an excellent system to show this off with, because once again, the display can update in place rather than scrolling or printing out the board for each generation. 
The way it works is you start by entering random data on the screen to set the location of the starting cells. When you're ready to run, you just press escape and watch it go. It's really mesmerizing. The number of generations is counted up at the top left. There was a whole community that grew up around this game to study different forms and results. Program International would also sell you this cassette for $5, but for another three bucks, they mail you the program source printed out too. And there we have it. We've seen how memory mapped video and an early cassette interface really gave the sphere some flexibility. You might've noticed that we wasted a ton of tape in each cassette. Could we have put all the games on one tape? Yes, we could have, and users typically did. But these are all very short programs written in assembly language. Sphere users did use BASIC though, loaded from cassette, but that was a much bigger commitment in terms of time and tape and required memory. We'll look at that and more soon. For now, please visit sphere.computer for more on this project. If you'd like to get in touch with me, my information is at sphere.computer slash contact. If you have Sphere equipment, materials, or just memories, I'd love to hear from you directly. Finally, these videos are mostly about the computer itself and not the company or people involved. If you'd like to learn more about that, please do check out the linked video to a talk I gave about Sphere history. Thank you.